So here at the bookstore, we have copies of book two in the series, a uh, series of Once Upon a Tim, and it is The Labyrinth of Doom. So we have copies. You can get them at the register here and upstairs, which is where we are going to go and for the signing this evening. So we will tell you more about that at the end. Um, Stuart will be talking about his series, Once Upon a Tim. Uh, both Once Upon a Tim and The Labyrinth of Doom will be available for sale and for signing. And we also have books from the other series as well. So this evening, Stuart Gibbs is here with us. He's the New York Times bestselling author of Charlie Thorne series, Fun Jungle series, Moon Base Alpha series, and Spy School series. He has written screenplays, worked on a whole bunch of animated films, developed TV shows, been a newspaper columnist, and researched Happy Barras. I had to look that up, the world's largest rodents, but I learned as I was preparing. And Stuart lives with his family in Los Angeles, so we are very lucky to have him here tonight. As I was preparing, I learned from the night in training, Tim, that dragons are not only foul-tempered, but they are foul-smelling. And Tim's description includes something about an armpit. So to say the least, I am pleased that we do not have any dragons here with us this evening. The book gives us so much to enjoy, including Tim's best friend, Belinda, and lots of illustrations. This one is one of my favorites, so I hope you get to look at it. Are they asleep? What happened? So many great uh, illustrations. So thankfully, we will have time for Q&A at the end, so get your questions ready. And please be sure any cell phones are silenced, and let's enjoy this discussion together. Please help me welcome Stuart Gibbs. Uh, so it's uh, first of all, this is one of my favorite bookstores. Anyhow, this is one of my favorite towns in America, uh, which I'm not. I'm not just saying that as lip service. I found one of the great things about being an author is that you get to travel around and see different places. And and so I discovered Madison and R.J. Julia like ten years ago, twelve. I don't know, but it's 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 always so much fun to come back and. Uh, I, this is the, um, you guys might remember there was a pandemic, I think it's still, uh, but, uh, uh, and it stopped all author travel pretty much for, for two and a half years. And so this is the first time I've spoken, uh, in a bookstore outside of, uh, you know, my, the ones close to me in Los Angeles. So I'm very, very excited that, uh, I could come back to RJ Juliet Madison for my first, uh, uh, my, uh, my, my, my re inaugural, I don't know what it is. So, um, so that's all very exciting. Um, I'm going to talk uh, uh, during the pandemic. Uh, one, one of the, one of the, um, there was a lot of bad. Uh, every once in a while, there was a little silver lining. And one of those uh, for me was uh, that uh, it allowed me to start this series because uh, I wasn't uh, able to go anyplace. And I couldn't do book tours or, or uh, do, well, I could, but they were all on Zoom. And so I wasn't leaving my house and suddenly I had a lot more time to write than I'd ever had before. And uh, I had been talking to my publisher uh, for a while uh, about possibly uh, starting a, a, a bit of it, maybe something that was for younger readers. And um, and, and that was able to happen because, because uh, you know, about two and a half years ago, right, right at the beginning of all this, where we thought, oh, we'll probably be stuck at home for another month or two. Uh, and, uh, and then it'll be over. We'll all be fine. Uh, um, so what happened was my, my publisher uh, asked me if I, I would have any interest doing uh, something that was illustrated. And I, and I thought that would just be a tremendous amount of fun uh, because uh, I, I thought it'd be nice to actually collaborate with, with an illustrator uh, at the time, I didn't know it'd be uh, Stacy Curtis, who has just uh, been just a delight to work with. Because uh, uh, you know, when you, when the idea is put forth, you want to uh, collaborate with an illustrator, hoping that the illustrator is going to bring a lot of jokes to the table too. And uh, and Stacy uh, really did that. Uh, and 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 so and when I saw it, his first illustrations. Like when he was sort of trying out, like that's what happens. That you, I, I wrote the text, and then uh, the, the illustrators send out illustrations, and, and I look at them and see if they make me laugh, and his made me laugh. So I thought, okay, great, uh, let's work with this guy. Uh, but the the idea for this, uh, when I told you that I want to do something illustrated in the first place, 
it turned, he said, do you have any ideas? And it turned out that I'd had an idea basically sitting, it, like it'd been in my head for 10 years and uh, or more or less. And uh, I, I did actually, uh, I, I worked in television and, uh, and film and, and it was originally when I first thought of it, I kind of thought of it like as a TV show idea, maybe. Uh, and what, what happened was that my, uh, this was like 10 years ago. So my, my daughter uh, was, was four and uh, I don't know if, if any of uh, you kids recall what you were like when you were four. I'm sure your parents do because there was just a stage you went through probably where the only movies you wanted to watch were Disney movies and you didn't want to watch them once. You wanted to watch them maybe six or 7,000 times. <laughs> and, and as the parent, you sometimes got stuck watching them over and over again. And so I was watching some movie with a princess for maybe the 7,000th time. And I started to think that as much as, as concerned as I was supposed to be about this princess, uh, and, and that there have been lots of other uh, Disney movies that were also about princesses, and I'm supposed to be concerned about all these princesses, but the princesses were actually royalty. And it's not to take away from the fact that they had some problems, but really back in olden times, the royal people had fewer problems than everybody else. because There were royal people, and then everybody else was basically a peasant. And if you were a peasant, that was terrible. Uh, there, there, um, uh, there, there was like really nothing good about being a peasant at all. And and so I kind of was thinking originally, like, well, what if we did an animated movie where it looked like it was about a princess or prince, and then we zoomed in on this little background dot and said, that's it's actually this guy's story. It's it's him. And uh, that didn't end up getting turned into a TV show, but I thought it would actually work pretty well as, uh, as, as an illustrated book. And, and if you've seen the first Once Upon a Tim, we kind of make that joke graphically at the very beginning where it, it looks like it's about this prince and then we zoom in on a little dot in the background behind him and, and it's the same story, Tim is a, is a peasant. Um, when I was uh, also, when we, so that was sort of the, 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 the first idea, but then I realized that, that there's just, uh, there's such a wealth of uh, of fairy tales and mythology and things like that to draw on, and um, I'm not the first person to sort of uh, go into this world and poke some fun at it. But uh, I I was uh, there were just so many things that I think a lot of the time you sort of hear these stories and and you hear them over and over again and you just start taking them at face value. Like yeah yeah okay that that's a story. But then if you really kind of step back and think about them, you think that story is just nuts. And um, so one of the first things I was thinking about when I first came up with the idea for this was the idea, was that story of the labyrinth in the, in, uh, on Crete and, and the Minotaur, and this story from mythology that we're all like, oh yeah, there's a guy and he had a giant labyrinth and there was a man-eating half man, half bull in there. And that doesn't make any sense at all when you think about it, um, that somebody would build a labyrinth that they would put a half man, half bull in there, that the half man, half bull would be carnivorous because bulls don't eat meat, they are meat. Uh, so uh, so none of this made any sense. And I actually had thought in the first book, maybe they would end up in a labyrinth. Uh, and then I, and then uh, eventually I was like, no, 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 that's that's kind of its own story. So uh, so I, I told uh, the first story in the series and then, and then, uh, but was very eager to do a second story that involved Labyrinth and a Minotaur. Uh, so you know what's going on in the series is that even though Tim is, a, it, although he's a peasant, uh, there was really uh, an actual fact about that, that, that's not ridiculous about about being a peasant back in olden times was that if you uh, if you really were interested in upward mobility, you had uh, virtually no options except to become a knight. And uh, so that is what. Uh, uh, Tim chooses the uh, that's that's the path he goes on. Uh, that really only applied if you were a, a, a guy peasant. If you were a girl peasant, you had no options at all to, uh, to lie and say you were a boy, and then you could become a knight. Uh, that's what happens with uh, Tim's best friend Belinda in this series. And um, so, uh, so, so we, we've got Tim, Belinda. There, 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 there's a couple other people who end up joining them. Also, uh, this is uh, Tim's for dog Rover. Uh, he did, I, he's a frog dog. Uh, he was a dog, but the witch next door got upset and turned him into a giant frog. So now he's a frog that acts like a dog. And uh, that means he can catch squirrels now uh, with his tongue. Uh, so what I thought I would do is I would read uh, a little bit of the first chapter 
although it seems like some of you may have already gone on and started reading this. Uh, but uh, I'm going to read uh, a little bit to give you a bit of a taste of the book, and then I'll uh, take some questions. Um, so chapter one is called How I Started My Day. Uh, I'm also going to uh, point out that this is, since I haven't, uh, this is the first time I've done, uh, also because of COVID, I never got to do a bookstore event. Uh, or read one of these books in public. And this is the first time I've read a book with illustrations in public, which means at one point or another, I'm probably gonna, I have to hold up the book and do the illustration. And you're not that close to it, but I'll do my best. Uh, once upon a time, it wasn't easy to be a knight in training. And I should point out that you don't have to read the first book to like this book, but or to read this book, but I uh, know that Tim is no longer a peasant, now he's knight in training this book. My name is Tim. I'm a junior member of the Knight Brigade for the great and glorious kingdom of Maryland. I don't really know you, but I'm guessing your normal morning goes something like this. Wake up, go to the bathroom, shower, maybe, get dressed, eat breakfast, go to school. Now, here's what I do on a typical morning. Wake up, face this, which is a dragon. That's right, I started my day by squaring off against a dragon. My head instructor, Sir Bible, leader of the brave and honorable Knights of Maryland, believes that a knight must be prepared to defend himself at any moment, even if that moment happens to be very, very early in the morning. So he will occasionally do something to keep me on my toes, like releasing a fire-breathing dragon into my room while I'm asleep. If I defeat the dragon, I pass the test. If the dragon defeats me, well, survival needs to find a new knight to train. <laughs> you know what it's like to wake up facing a dragon? It sticks, literally. You probably know that dragons are foul tempered and are covered with scales and breathe fire, but people rarely talk about the fact that they smell like a dead fish that someone kept in their armpit for a week. <laughs> also, it's quite scary. I will admit, the first thing I did upon seeing a dragon staring at me was shriek in fear. But then, I'm only 12 years old. The second thing I did was roll off the pile of hay I was sleeping on in the knight's barracks at the castle. People in my time don't have beds unless they are royals. We sleep on piles of hay if we're lucky enough to find it. And if we're not lucky enough to find hay, we sleep on things like dirt or gravel. Then I grabbed the sword and shield that I learned to keep by my side at all times, which turned out to be a very wise decision, as the dragon released a blast of fire, which I was able to deflect like this. Dragons can't blast you with flame forever. Eventually, they have to stop to recharge. So when they, when this one did, I took out my sword and, oh, I just realized what you're thinking. You're thinking, that's only a baby dragon. The way he was narrating, I thought he was fighting a real dragon. That puny little thing doesn't look that dangerous at all. Well, you're wrong. A baby dragon is plenty dangerous. It's not like I was fighting a rat here. Baby dragons might be smaller than adult dragons, but they still have bad attitude, sharp teeth, nasty claws, and the whole breathing fire. Making one false move around a baby dragon, Make one false move around a baby dragon, and it will fricassee your butt. <laughs> this one was particularly unpleasant. It kept trying to claw me, bite me, and flame broil me. I defended off re repeatedly with my sword and my shield. There we see. There he is, bending it off in various different ways. However, there is one thing you can do to a baby dragon that you can't do to an adult. This. Here he is, booting it out the way. <laughs> Try kicking an adult dragon in the rear end. And you'll break all your toes, and then you'll get eaten. Mm -hmm. But this worked. Once I booted him out the window, the little jerk decided he'd had enough. He'd had enough, and flew off to roost in one of our castle turrets. A moment later, Sir Bible entered my room. Mm -hmm. Sir Bible was revered throughout the land as one of the bravest, most dashing knights. Mm -hmm. He was heavily scarred from many storied battles. He had lost two fingers in the orc wars. He had lost an eye in the Battle of the Basilisks. And he lost his nose in a fight against a giant manticore. <laughs> he also lost his he also lost his temper a lot. <laughs> Survival might have been a great knight who had served the kingdom with honor for many years, but he wasn't very nice or understanding. You never wanted to make him angry. I looked at him expect, expectantly. That he said, 
was absolutely horrible. My spirit sagged. Really? I asked, because I managed to fend a dragon off without so much as a scratch. You barely managed to fend off a baby dragon, survival said dismissively. If I had fought like that in a great dragon uprising, this whole kingdom would have been burned to the ground. And it took you way too long to chase that little thing off. Your cousin Bull took care of the one I put in his room in half the time. My spirit sagged even more. Bull isn't really my cousin, and he isn't really a he. Bull is really my best friend, Belinda, who is pretending to be a boy so she can also become a knight. In my time, peasant girls only have two career options, housewife or witch. Belinda didn't like either of those, so she chose to live a lie instead. <laughs> She'd always been better at fighting, throwing axes and stabbing things than I had. But now that she was training to be a knight, her skills were improving quickly. Just a few days before, Belinda had handily defeated Sir Cuss, one of the kingdom's most honored knights in a practice fight. And I can see that she defeated him. There's survival over here. If you want to become a member of this force, you're going to have to do much better, survival told me. Much, 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 much better. Now get this room cleaned up. There's dragon poop in the corner. With that, he stormed out, slammed the door behind him. Like I said, training wasn't easy. The sun had barely risen, and I had already fought a dragon and been chewed out by my commander. My day only got worse from there. <laughs> a lot worse. <laughs> so, um, I can. I'm happy to take some questions here. Yes, yes, right here. Um, how many days did it take to make this one have how, how many days? Well, a lot of times people say how long. Uh, uh, thank you for thinking it only took days. Uh, <laughs> um, it takes, uh, I will, it takes a little bit less time to write these books than some of the other books I do, but because they're shorter. That's one of the things. So um, I, uh, it, it generally takes me about uh, three months to maybe even six months to write the first draft of a book. That depends a lot of the time on how long that book is and whether or not my children are in school or if they're home and bothering me. Uh, and uh, and then I have to do other drafts. I, I have to do several other drafts. Uh, so uh, I, I do about uh, maybe eight drafts, maybe 10 drafts of a book. Each one of those takes at the time. So this one might be a little bit less time than uh, uh, some other books, but still generally uh, an average, uh, the, the amount of days it takes me to write a book is probably in the six to 700 range. Now I, I can go and work on other books back and forth in that time. I'm not working 100% on that same book nonstop, but that's about the length of time it takes to get a book. Yes, back there. What's your favorite series that you've written? What's my favorite series that I've written? Um, that is a, perfectly fine question uh and yet i do not have a perfectly fine answer for it uh i um you know i, I i'm writing four series right now the reason i'm writing four series is because i like writing them all under five if i if i like writing one more than the others i i would probably just uh do that one um so it's 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 a little bit like saying uh which of my kids is my favorite kid uh and for the record, because uh, it's being recorded, I do not have a favorite child uh, <laughs> most days. Uh, um, but uh, but I don't mind if you have a favorite of my series. So if you're trying to figure out which of them to read, I would say you know go with the one that that intrigues you the most. And, and um, one of the reasons I'm doing Once Upon a Time is to maybe get kids who, who are a little more uh, reluctant to read to start reading my stuff a little bit earlier. But, but, uh, but I'm, I'm okay if you read any one of my series. But, uh, yes, right here. You start writing. When did I start writing my books? Um, I first started trying. Well, okay, so sort of two ways. I, I mean, I first got a book published. Uh, my first book got published about 11 years ago. That was Belly Up. And I started writing Belly Up two years before it got published. Uh, but if you really want to say when I start writing books, period, I started writing before I, when, when I was younger than you. I was trying to write books like my whole life. Uh, so I, I wrote a book. Uh, I wrote several things it, it, trying to get them. Uh, I tried to get books published when I was in kindergarten, first grade. Uh, I did not. Uh, I, my, my school library did get a book I wrote in the school library when I was in kindergarten. So uh, so other people could check out this book I wrote uh, called The Day the Dinosaurs Came Back. Um, uh, it was, it, it, you know, uh, Michael Crichton, then 
very suspiciously wrote a book called Jurassic Park. <laughs> um, I don't know if he went to my elementary school or not. Um, and, um, I had a kid there, I guess. Uh, but uh, so I was trying to write books really my 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 whole life. Uh, yeah, wait, in the back, we'll see, we'll go to, in, the, in the Woodstock. Yeah. yeah. Um, why did I want to become an author? Uh, I didn't, I don't really feel like I had any choice in the matter. Like I just always like I really don't remember a point in my life where I was not trying to write stories. Uh, and, and so uh, it just was uh, it, it was just like what I wanted to do. I would come into a bookstore like this and I would try and find like where my books would go on the shelf uh, someday. So uh, so it was just it was just like it was like a lifelong. Uh, goal. I, I I will say like I you know I ended up doing other kinds of writing which was all good. Uh, I enjoyed that, but but uh, but I really like uh, writing books the best. So I'm, I'm glad that that finally ended up working out. Oh man, we got a whole baseball team here. Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah. Why why in Moonbase? So okay, so when I started the Moonbase Island series, which is a series that takes place at the very first Moonbase. Um, I thought that that series was like going to go for a very, I was hoping it was going to go for a really long time. And then what happened was uh, I realized that uh, writing on the moon was much more limiting than I, than I realized. Like that, that, uh, that uh, I, I probably, you know, I, I wanted to make a kind of realistic moon base. So it's very small and, uh, and there wasn't, there weren't that many rooms in it. And then even more importantly, if you, if you go anywhere on the moon, it pretty much looks like everywhere else on the moon. There's not a lot of variation in the moon. Uh, so, you know, if you go five miles from here in any direction, uh, you will be in a very different terrain or you'll drown, I guess. But, um, <laughs> but, but, uh, but it just, you know, the, like the earth changes dramatically, uh, very quickly. And, uh, and the moon doesn't. And, and also when you're on the moon, you're always in a, in a, space suit there's very little you can do so i started to realize that like I, I i there wasn't that much i could explore uh and so if i was going to keep having scenes over and over and over in the same place in the moon base or, or out on the lunar surface it was just going to start feeling repetitive and i didn't want it to start feeling repetitive and i was i was on book three and i called my publisher and i said i we got to end this at book three but i i i had an idea for book four but I, I just couldn't figure out how to make it feel fresh so uh, so I, I was very upset to end that series, but I, okay, we're gonna go in order through the baseball team. <laughs> <laughs> well, plus you had a little different right? Which book did you work the hardest? Which which uh, the work the hardest on? Um, so the, the first book in the series is always kind of the most work, like and and for a lot of these, like right, like on this, I've been kicking the idea around for ten years, uh, but really, um, the ones. Like if I say like beyond that, the ones I have to do the most research on are the most work. So I do the Charlie Thorne series that is very heavily in depth research, um, uh, and so I I I spend a lot of time reading up and working on that and trying to get all my facts right. Um, uh, if you anybody here has read Charlie Thorne and the Curse of Cleopatra, uh, my the person whose research I relied on the most is going to be here tomorrow night, who's Stacy Schiff. So, uh, so, um, so come on back, see her. Uh, um, get another stamp on your card, uh, and and then, uh, so yeah, so those those just those take a lot of work working those stories out. Uh, okay, so now in the in the in the back, right? Yeah, in the gap sweatshirt. Thing. Is it true? Be careful of the next page, maybe on. Uh, uh, is that is that is, is that your bookmark? That is, um, that is yes, yes. This this in this bookstore, many of the books are haunted, and so you have to be very, very careful. Uh, okay, yes. Now they're in the tight. Your favorite book you've written? What's my favorite book I've written? That still that kind of falls into the same sort of category. If if if, if there's like a not having a favorite uh, book. Uh, of, of my own, like same thing. Like if I, if I have trouble picking a favorite series, I have even more trouble picking a favorite book because I, I, I think I'm officially with this at, at 28 books now, maybe 29. I, I'm officially at the point where I can't remember how many books I published. Um, and and so it, it becomes even harder to. Uh, pick. But I'll talk about a great book that I love, uh, 
that inspired me as a kid, which is the Westing game uh, by Ellen Raskin, uh, which is just uh, one of the best mysteries ever written. And uh, and I read it when I was your age and thought it was amazing. And I reread it all the time because I can still learn how to make a great mystery from reading that mystery. Uh, okay, uh, in the back. In the, I was gonna say, base, every guy here is a baseball cap. Amazing. Why did you choose Albert Einstein as the focus for the group study for my book? Why did you choose Albert Einstein as a focus? Because actually, that the whole idea for that book series came to me because I was at a, a science. Uh, I, was at a, uh, I was at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City, and there was an exhibit on Albert Einstein. And I was in that exhibit, and I uh, and I started to think. I, I came with the idea of the last equation while I was walking around that exhibit, and then everything else in that series came much later. So, so Einstein was right there from from the get go. Uh, okay, uh, right there in the pirate. Right. Uh, um, what was your children's favorite book of the series? Was my children's favorite book of the series? Uh, that well. Um, <laughs> That is it. I, I'm gonna uh, let me call them. Uh, uh, you know, uh, I, there's a special thing where um, as the authors do. One is that my my kids uh, get to edit my books. Uh, so my daughter would probably say it's like something that she caught the most mistakes in. I don't know. <laughs> uh, my my I also allow my kids to show up in books on occasion. Uh, and yeah, yeah, yeah. So they so they so they might. Uh, prefer the books that they're actually in, or maybe now they're old enough that they are their least favorite book. Right? <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, yeah, right there. Um, how long are you gonna gonna continue like the Spy School series and the Fun Rainbow series? Uh, I, I'm not sure how much longer I'm gonna uh, uh, continue all. I mean, any of my series at this moment, because um, I, you know, I kind of do them to like what happens with Moonbase Alpha, where I say, oh, I gotta stop this because it's gonna not be fun. Um. Spy School is the book I, is the series I have the most books in, in part because it's the most popular series and also because it's the easiest for me to come up with ideas. Um, uh, and although once upon a time may give that some, some competition. Uh, and uh, so, you know, is uh, mo most times when people write to me about my series, they ask for more books. Every once in a while somebody says, please stop. But I, <laughs> I, I, mean, I ignore them. Uh, so I'm going to sort of keep going with my series until uh, I feel like the time has come to end them. Uh, so I don't think that Spy School is going to be like the Hardy Boys and have 300 books in it. But, you know, maybe. I don't know. Uh, in the back. Uh, did you enjoy working with an illustrator or do you like working alone? Um, I, did I like working with the illustrator? I, I really enjoyed working with the illustrator. Uh, it might be a little surprising to know that and Stacey and I don't actually work. I mean, like I sort of do my stuff, then he does his stuff, then I give him like a few notes, and that's kind of it, because because he's just so good at this. And 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 so there's there's really like not that much back and forth. Like it's just like I I mean what one of the reasons I wanted because I thought it'd be just so much fun. I sort of write a thing and I say like I want pictures of this and this and this and this. And then Stacy just does it. And every time he does an illustration, I'm just like, oh my gosh, that's so much better than I could have ever imagined. So <laughs> that part is great. Uh, it's 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 a fun uh, collaboration, but uh, uh, but I I you know it's not in a weird way that much different than just me writing books on my own because I'm just like sort of going like, okay, do something funny here. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, yeah. In the in the Moonbase Alpha series, how do you pronounce it? The like the family last Oh, the Schilbergs? The Schilberg yeah. family in the movie? Yeah. Yeah, that was it. That was the whole question. <laughs> I mean, the fact of the matter is, like, it's, like, really usually, like, it doesn't matter. Like, it's just however you think it's pronounced, then, then it's pronounced. Just because I say it's pronounced that way, that you were reading it. It's like that uh, Hermione person in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in Harry Potter, who then all of a sudden became Hermione when the movies came out. <laughs> I was pretty sure it was Hermione. Um, uh, yes, right there. Uh, just asking, but what is whale well down the whale? Oh, oh, what is, what is well done? The, the next, um, so that is the next fun jungle book. Uh, so thank you for being my PR person here. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Uh, um, so Well Done is is the is the eighth book in the Fun Jungle series. Uh, I was getting I, I don't usually take uh, suggestions from readers, but like when 
700 readers make the same suggestion. I kind of have to pay attention. And so many kids were saying, please do a, a, a mystery involving a whale. And uh, so I, um, uh, so, so I, I, I kind of, I, um, and, and I had to move it out of fun journal because they don't, uh, I, they don't really have well. So, I, so the idea is that this is the first time I've written uh, a book that takes place where I live in Southern California and uh, a whale uh, washes up on, um, on, uh, on the beach in, in front of the Malibu colony. So the Malibu colony is kind of like if you, if you went and found like the richest, fanciest beach here, maybe down, maybe go to the Hamptons and you say, okay, these places, uh, and, and imagine a big dead blue whale there. And they say, oh, wait, we think somebody killed this whale. And then before they can go to do the autopsy, uh, the bad guys blow it up. And so now imagine uh, that, that now the Hamptons have been smeared with whale guts. And, and everything, that, that's, that's kind of, that's, that's how we get started with that mystery. So, uh, uh, so, uh, but uh, but it is a, it is a uh, it is a suspicious uh, whale murderer followed by a whale explosion, and uh, and then there's a there's a subplot. That. So that's that's uh, what uh, uh, whale done is about. All right, I think we've gotten to a lot of questions. Uh, we've, uh, everybody got their question answered. I got them all. Okay, that's uh, awesome. Um, now, yes, we're ready. You're gonna. Thank you, you very much. Thank you for coming.